What's up, everyone? Today we have an awesome guest on the show, and his name is Kevin Miller. And Kevin is an award-winning screenwriter, director, and producer whose projects include Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, With God on Our Side, and Hellbound, which is what we'll be talking about today. And in addition to his work in film, he's written and co-written and edited over 40 books. So Kevin, it's good to have you on the show, man. Hey, good to be here. Cool. You know, growing up as a Christian, um, I remember the days when I'd be in public, I'd be in a public place, and then I'd look around at people's faces and think, man, you know, most of these people, if they were to die tonight, they're going to be in hell forever, you know, and then I'd feel this, this deep sadness and this urgency to like share my faith, you know, with as many people as possible. So, you know, obviously the belief in hell can play a huge role in, in a religious person's life, you know, but... I'd like for you to share your story with my listeners, your background, and how you ended up making a film about hell, and what your goal was with it. Yeah, well, maybe I'm uh, I'm a little more selfish than you, but I think I worried more about me going. To hell <laughs> going uh, but uh, you know, I to be honest, I became a Christian when I was nine years old uh, at a Bible camp, and I I came home from that experience that summer, and I was really afraid to tell my family about the decision I'd made because they sort of ridiculed the uh, people who had converted me. Um, uh -huh. And so I, I have a very vivid memory of standing on the driveway of my, uh, on my farm where I grew up and looking at my family out working in the garden and just having this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach that unless I told them what I knew, they were all going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I was too afraid to tell them. And right, so it was, right. a, it was a real predicament to be in as a young kid and something I wrestled with. So, yeah, definitely I think hell, it... it, it I, I always think about it as uh, this idea of eternal, eternal conscious torment is almost like a parasite that snuck in with the gospel and, mm. and eventually it, it grew and grew and, and threatened to overwhelm the host. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so did you grow up like your family was atheist or they're just not as serious when it comes to church or something like that? Well, it's interesting. My grandfather was a, a minister in the United Church of Canada, which is it's a definitely a very liberal church. In fact, the head of the United Church of Canada right now is trying to hold on to her job, um, mm. even though she's an atheist. She's claiming that um, belief in God isn't necessary yeah, to uh, yeah. hold her position. So that's the kind of church uh, that he pastored in. And um, But my grandfather mm. made no bones about the fact that he didn't believe in God either, but he just really felt religion was um, you know, something good for society. And he was right. a real you know, pillar of the community type guy. But my parents, mm. I'll say that my, my mother had made a commitment, I think, when she was a child, but at the time, you know, my church life consisted of my mom dropping us off for Sunday school and then going back oh, home, okay. you, you know, that sort of thing. So it, was, it wasn't a very, um, you know, uh, religious environment, yeah. although my parents became Christians later on. Oh, okay. So when did you start questioning the doctrine of hell then? Well, it's, I think it's something that never really sat right with me. But in terms of really starting to consciously question it, um, it wasn't something I, I really sought out. Um, it just, I actually began working with uh, a guy, you know, uh, Brad Jersak. Yeah. Um, I edited a number of books for Brad, and one of them had to do with the atonement. It's a book called Stricken by God, right. which uh, is a collection of essays having to, that are taking a look at the atonement to say that perhaps the violence that we see there is a product not of God's wrath, but of human wrath. Right. And that just really started me, you know, I, I guess really what it did was, start to help me articulate some of the questions I had. And once you start revisiting your view of the atonement, well, hell is really connected to that. Mm -hmm. And so um, a couple of years later, I ended up editing a book for Brad called Her Gates Will Never Be Shut, which was really his attempt to reconsider the received teaching about hell to right. say that, well, you know, maybe what the Bible says about hell, maybe there's not just one thing it says, maybe there's all kinds of competing visions and, and maybe within the interpretive history of the church, there's been a number of different views. And so again, I think just following along behind Brad, I realized, you know what, um, this, there's, there's so much freedom in terms of how we look at these types of things where I think that when you, you become beholden to this idea of hell as a place of eternal torment that you're going to go to if somehow you do the wrong thing, mm -hmm. um, that prohibits you from being able to think critically to ask questions. And so I think what, what really Brad's influence on me was was, was to give me the, fr the freedom to say, no, you can ask questions about these things. In fact, this has been a live discussion for the entire history of the church. And so 
I got really excited, you know, working on those books, and that's really what inspired me a few years later to begin working on Hellbound. Wow. No, that that's cool because I mean that that book was very instrumental for me too when I first started questioning hell. And it's interesting because obviously growing up as a Christian, it was something that you know you just don't want to think about. You know, for me, I would just kind of yeah, that's just where people go when they're not Christian. But I never really looked into the subject until I started questioning uh, the atonement. You know, which is just like you. And so it's it's so interesting on how those two things are connected somehow when you think about what happened at the cross and, and all of a sudden it leads to what happens in the afterlife because it somehow shows like who who this type of God that you're believing in is, you know. And um by the way, her, her gates will never be shut. That's that's a really good book. I'll be I'll be promoting that too on in the show notes. You know, in the in the beginning of your film, you know, you have this conversation with people from the Westboro Baptist Church. You know, and they're telling you why God created hell. Now, at least from what I'm aware of, right, both both religious and non-religious people consider them a bunch of nut jobs, you know. And yet there are many loving, so-called Bible-believing Christians who still believe in hell. And so why do you think they still believe in hell, though? Well, first of all, I would say I, I wouldn't consider the Westboro Baptist a bunch of nut jobs. Actually, if you, you talk to these people, several of them are, are lawyers. They're very well educated. Mm. Um, and if you listen to some of the, the young girls who have come out of the movement recently, I mean, these people aren't crazy. These people are basically caught up in a, in a cult-like mentality. Right, and so, right. you know, you become emotionally invested in a certain set of beliefs, and that tends to do a number on your ability to think critically. Mm. And, I, and I think hell is definitely one of those because you also have fear enter the equation. And so, once again, your ability to think critically about the belief is, is impaired. And so, it's funny that when you step back away from a belief in, of, in eternal conscious torment, you sort of look at yourself and other people around you with amazement to go, how on earth in the 21st century could anyone believe this? <laughs> exactly. But I mean, if, if, if you listen to the deconversion stories of people who've left Scientology and that sort of thing, like yeah. uh, if you listen to Paul Haggis, the screenwriter and director, mm. he's he's been really articulate about that and, and how he got sucked into believing these utterly outlandish things, um, yeah. even though he's, he's not a stupid person. Yeah. Um, so it just is sort of, it's one of the things that happens when you, you, you know, fall under the sway of uh, some type of a belief system. Right. But uh, as far as, you know, people who are not as belligerent as the Westboro Baptist Church believing in hell, um, I would put the people who, you know, the people who led me to Christ in that category, you know, I was really attracted to them because they were some of the most loving, you know, fun people to be with, these, yeah. these evangelicals. And yet they you know, very staunchly believed in hell, and they believe that by sharing the gospel, they are sh saving people from it. So I think people hold to it because um, within evangelicalism is a very high regard for scripture, and, mm -hmm. and not just scripture, but this idea that um, nothing should come between us and the Bible, that, that we need to read the Bible literally. And I think that there's a level of ignorance involved in terms of that belief because nobody reads the Bible literally mm -hmm. because um, it's impossible. Number one, because we don't read it in the in the original languages, we're always reading a, a translation, which is an interpretation, and even the documents that the Bible was translated from are themselves copies of documents. So we're always several step re steps removed, and you know nobody reads anything literally we always we we have to impose an interpretation based on our culture our gender um other beliefs that we hold and so what happens is this this worldview that we bring to the text it just naturally um makes something apparent some things apparent but conceals others um ron dart who appears in hellbound he, he has a great way of saying it he says that every reading of a text reveals some things and conceals others mm. And I know that even as a book editor, I've edited a lot of books and, you know, you can be reading a book for content and you totally miss, for instance, a glaring typo in the header right. or even in the title because right. you weren't looking for that. Right. Um, you were looking for something else. And so I think there's this sense amongst evangelicals that they've inherited this belief that um, holding to eternal conscious torment is the only faithful what they would call biblical position to hold. And mm -hmm. so I think they're doing it for the right reasons. But unfortunately, then few people step back and really try and reconcile this idea of eternal torment with um, an, a God whose love is infinite. And, mm -hmm. and it just, it's, it's very difficult to reconcile it. Yeah. yeah. 
the two once you really start to think critically about it. Yeah. So do you think that if, if it weren't for the Bible, then a lot of people wouldn't be believing in hell then? I, well, you know, there's hell in other religions, I guess. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think um, the idea of hell or the idea that if there is a life beyond this life, that somehow the crimes that are committed in this life must be atoned for is a natural instinct that most people have. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, and the same thing with um, people who aren't rewarded in this life in the way that they should be rewarded. There's a sense that for the scales of justice to be balanced, if God is good, then and if and if there is some sort of a life after this one, then somehow those scales have to be set right. And so I think the instinct, you know, hell represents a very human instinct to see justice done. Mm-hmm. So whether we would believe in in sort of the the idea of, of a place of fiery torment or you know the Christian version, I'm not sure, but but this idea has popped up in many many other religions. Right, right, yeah. I mean, exactly what you were saying. There's just a sense of you know all the wrongs of this world. Need, there should be some some God out there or whatever who's going to make things right again. At least that's the instinct that a lot of people have. You know? Yeah, and uh, you know, so if you're talking about this this Christian version, um, but typically like. A lot of people have this version in their minds of, of people burning in flames and demons with pitchforks poking at you and everyone screaming and yelling. You know, where where does that idea of hell come from? You know, is that from the Bible or somewhere else? Right. Well, I think that, you know, these this, this imagery that we have definitely is not from the Bible. I mean, the image of fire you'll find in the Bible yeah. um, and the idea of a dragon, um, you know, in reference to Satan or a serpent. But a lot of the imagery that that tends to show up in horror movies or just in our imagination is a product of, you know, uh, medieval artwork right. and uh, things like Dante's Inferno. Hmm. So they're very much a, a product of extra biblical sources as opposed to the Bible. Um, there again, people want to say that Jesus talked about hell more than anyone else. Yeah. He didn't really number one because he never used the term hell. He talked about a place called Gehenna and he used all kinds of imagery, things like outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he did use the imagery of flames, but, um, you know, people have, uh, have built on that and, and there's been a huge amount of inflation because there's something kind of actually inherently appealing uh, about hellish imagery. Um, mm-hmm. I think it, it, it's like a horror movie, right? It, it allows us to manifest our fears and confront them, mm-hmm. um, you know, through, through that type of imagery. Right, right. I mean, let's go back to what you just said about Jesus, you know, because I, I often hear that a lot, you know, where people are like, Jesus spoke about hell more than heaven. You know, people say that in their sermons and in their blogs. But so you were saying he's talking about Gehenna and all that stuff. Can you kind of elaborate on that? So what, what would be your response to those people who, who talk about or who say that Jesus spoke more about hell than heaven? Well, again, I, what I would want to do is refer those people to Brad Jersak's book, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut, because mm-hmm. Brad does such a good job of showing that in the Bible, of course, the word hell never shows up. And, and in the Old Testament yeah. and the New Testament, there's a collection of terms that older translations, like the King James uh, version of the Bible, used hell as a catch-all phrase. So there's mm-hmm. there's um, a phrase like Gehenna, which is the one Jesus uses exclusively, which is, um, it's a valley, a literal valley outside of Jerusalem that has a, a prophetic association with it um, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, some bad things that happened to to uh, the Jews as a result of, uh, you know, the things they had done, worshiping false gods and that sort of thing. So there's, it, it's a literal place that had a symbolic sense of importance. And also within the, you know, amongst the Pharisees at the time, there's, you know, certain religious groups did have a belief in some sort of a, an afterlife uh, that had punishment and rewards. But, but these beliefs really weren't faithful to um, you know, ancient Judaism, they were more um, on the liberal front of the religion where they're incorporating these ideas from some of the, the uh, other groups around them. So um, I think that a lot of times people make the mistake that when they see Jesus talk about Gehenna, they assume that he is either originating an idea or validating an idea, mm-hmm. where I think what he's doing sometimes is just acknowledging a mythology that exists, right. and then he's he's almost always using it against the people who believe in it the most. Mm-hmm. So when he's mentioning um, Gehenna, um, he's often warning those who hold this belief in postmortem punishment. He's he's saying, you know what, that belief is the very belief that's going to come back and get you, not the people that you think it's going to get, right. because what it's doing is it's making you self-centered. And instead of, um, you know, 
drawing close to God, making you more selfless, it's making you selfish. Mm. And, and, you know, I think that's the irony of hell, um, eternal conscious torment and annihilationism, because what it does is it makes every act a selfish act, ultimately, because the, the number one thing you're worried about is, is saving yourself. Right. And and saving those around you, it's it, it makes it turns you inward, and so even when you do acts of service, I think if you dig deep enough under the motivation, you'll find that ultimately it's somebody hoping that they've done enough and believe enough right. in order to avoid going to hell, right. and so it's you know I think it's it's a horrific thing. Yeah, yeah. No, and I'm glad you brought up uh, Brad's book. You know, when I was reading his book a couple of years ago, one of the things that was going on in my mind just because of my the, the questions that would arise would be like near-death experiences you know and i know brad does touch on that like towards the end of his book just a little bit but you know as you were talking about earlier you were, you were saying that you know this the imagery that that a lot of people have of hell some of it's in the bible some of it's not now back in the day when i would study a lot of my like apologetics and stuff at least the guys that I were that you know that I was reading, he would, they would always say stuff like, "Oh, you know, fire doesn't really mean a literal fire. This is more like a metaphorical view, and darkness is just means something else." And what we think, but yet, as I was growing up, I saw a lot of those stories of people who literally did see <laughs> fire and you know demons and and just like you know the twenty three minutes in hell book that I read a long time ago, and so that was like a, a really confusing part, you know, when I was like questioning the doctrine of hell because here I am, I'm, I'm reading these different types of scholars on these issues, but yet people have these experiences, you know, mm -hmm. so which one really trumps the other? Just a guy who, you know, researched the original language or these people that had, had you know, they actually had some sort of real experience. So how would you address someone who's just, you know, sharing their own near-death experience where they did see a lot of these imagery, you know, the imagery that we did, you know, from Dante's Inferno, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's interesting you bring up 23 Minutes in Hell, uh, because if you watch the Hellbound DVD, one of the special features features an interview with the author of that book, Bill Weiss. Yeah. We, also, we also interviewed another woman um, who works with YOM who had had a, a vision of hell. Now, neither of these people that we interviewed had a near-death experience, um, but, uh, you know, it's... It's interesting that their, you know, their experience will be similar to other types of experiences you can hear about Mary Baxter, some of these right. people. Right. Um, and you know, what do I make of those experiences? My my sense of Bill Weiss and the other woman we interviewed was that these people uh, were sincere. You know, Bill, for instance, I think he went seven years speaking on this and receiving no money because he never wanted huh. it to, never wanted people to think that he was just trying to. You right, know, right. make himself rich. And he, right. I think he's done pretty good in real estate anyway. But um, he, uh, you know, and, and the same thing with the other woman that uh, who actually was very traumatized by what she had experienced. And and I would never question the fact that these people had experiences. But right. but what what do they mean? And right. and how authoritative are we to take them? And and that's where we need to step back and really. Um, not not really be swayed by the content of their experience, but we need to evaluate their experience the same way we would evaluate any so-called spiritual experience. Right, and that's to analyze it in light of of reason, tradition, and scripture. And and so you know when you take some of these things that that they've said, there's there's uh, you know whole websites devoted to pointing out, for instance, the aspects of Bill Weiss's testimony that that clearly contradict you know, various parts of scripture and that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. So, um, does God speak to people through visions and that sort of thing? Uh, you know, I, I don't question that, but yeah. the question is, are we meant to take these visions literally? Um, you know, how are we to interpret them? You know, it's, it's really the same as, as coming to a biblical text is it's, it's really a matter of how do we interpret these experiences? Right. And it's interesting too, because I, I was, I mean, I still am interested in studying about near-death experiences, and and they're so different from each other. <laughs> you know, there, mm -hmm. there's some similarities here and there, but there's there's some differences, and and sometimes it's even dependent upon the person's background. You know, what yeah. religion they came from, of who they see. You know, so you were mentioning even that lady who you said was uh, traumatized by her. So she didn't have like a near-death experience, did she? It was just she, she, it, it was it was a vision. It yeah. was a vision, you know. So she was traumatized by that, and obviously she saw hell. So I once heard you say that the the belief in hell creates hell, and and I agree with that. You know, can you elaborate on that more? Well, yeah, I, I think that uh, sort of as I mentioned earlier is that once this fear becomes introduced into your life, 
it does put you in hell because now you're um, engaged with a God that you don't know uh, if you can trust fully and you don't know if you've ever done enough um, or believed enough or whatever. So you're, you're put in a state of just constant anxiety. And, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that's, it's a, it, it introduces you to a hellish existence. Yeah. And, and so this is ironic because my belief is that, you know, Jesus didn't come to warn us that we better shape up or we're going to hell. He came to set us free from the hell that we're in. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that, um, that's really the gospel, which is freedom from the hells that we impose on ourselves every day. Right. So, if, I mean, if that is the gospel, though, you know, if, if someone believes in the Christian God, right, does that necessarily mean they have to believe in hell, too? You know, for instance, some people say, well, you can't tell them the good news unless you tell them the bad news first, you know. So, in other words, hell supposedly has to be part of the Christian message, at least according to a lot of people. You know, what do you say to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I recognize that a lot of people would believe that. But, but again, it comes back to what is the substance of the gospel? I mean... Uh, the book of Hebrews says that, you know, uh, Jesus came to set those free who all their lives were held prisoners by by the fear of death. Hmm. You know, what, what what is what is Jesus coming to set us free from? And um, I really believe it's it's from, um, you know, w- what he does, the center of the gospel is is the defeat of death. I mean, if you look at the substance of the of the uh, sermons that are preached in the book, book of Acts, hmm. um, the good news is that Jesus is alive, that, that the one that you thought you had killed, he's come back, and therefore we no longer have to fear death. So what does it mean to no longer fear death? Hmm. I mean, it, it, it means letting go of the self. It hmm. means being able to lay oneself down for other people because we don't need to hold on to anything anymore. So again, it comes back to what is the substance of the gospel? Is it about what happens after we die? Or is it about calling us into a new way of living? And I, I definitely go with the latter. Right. Uh, just focusing on the now. So does that mean that hell, you know, the afterlife and all that, it's not in the equation at all when it comes to sharing a message to somebody? Should it's not that- a, It's not in my equation. Okay. So what, what did the early church believe then? You know, so I mean, this, from what I see now, especially in American evangelical Christianity, you do preach hell. You know, at the end of your evangelistic crusade, you'll say, do you know where you're going to go if you were to die tonight, right? So obviously things evolved, at least with, when it comes to the gospel message. So what did the early church believe about hell? Well, it's it's interesting. It depends what part of the early church you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, because you see, you know, even in in Paul's letters, um, or even in the Book of Acts, um, you know, immediately <laughs> you're seeing disputes about all kinds of different issues. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, it really depends if you ask Peter or you ask Paul. And we see one of the things I really appreciate about the early church and about the Jewish, uh, you know, Old Testament scriptures as well is that. Uh, the writers didn't sanitize anything, um, mm-hmm. that these types of disagreements and disputes, they documented them. Yeah. And I think, I think it's really important um, and because it helps us, you know, uh, watch them work through these, these, uh, these sorts of controversies. And then even when you get into, you know, the first few hundred years of the church, you're seeing all kinds of different beliefs around these issues. And people, you know, going from, you see Christians going from being persecuted by the uh, the Roman government um, to persecuting each other mm. uh, over these types of things. I just <laughs> I just actually finished working on a novel um, that looks at the dispute between uh, Athanasius and, and uh, Arius over the, oh, the wow. idea over the idea of uh, the, the divinity the, yeah. di- uh, the divinity of Christ. Mm. So. Um, yeah, so what did the early church believe? I mean, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> um, and I, I I'll just say this, is that I think within the church, there's always been a variety of different views on the topic. And right. so, you know, that's one of the things I tried to get across in Hellbound. Right, right. Which is why we should at least be open to other versions of hell other than the eternal conscious torment. Because, you know, like when I was in Bible school, uh, it just seemed like common sense to a lot of people that that's the only view and that the rest was heretical. You know, anything that's outside. I remember we were talking about John Stott in Bible school and that mm-hmm. was heretical. Universalism was, wasn't much of an issue when I was going to my seminary. But, you know, it, it just comes to show that if you look at the, you know, in the early church, not everybody was a universalist. Where universalist meaning that in the end all will be saved. But it just shows that there were many different views at that time. And just a lot of people aren't aware of that, unfortunately, you know, to at least accept it within 
that you could still be a Christian and you could still hold to those types of views other than eternal conscious torment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously, you know, there, there's a lot of evil that happens all around the world. And earlier you were talking about how there, we just kind of have this, this natural instinct to want a sense of justice, you know, where all the wrongs will be made right somehow. Um, you know, but just think of like 9-11, you know, then there are those people like Hitler and Osama bin Laden and Kim Jong-il. And, you know, doesn't it make sense that like a just God would give them what they deserve? You know, because like I know for a lot of people, they'll say, you know, what kind of God who says vengeance is mine is just going to let people off the hook and give them a free ride, <laughs> you know, enter the gates of heaven without any punishment? You know, so what would you say to that? Well, again, uh, that's that's one of the reasons why I used 9-11 as a framing device for Hellbound is because I felt, you know, here's something, uh, a narrative that's very, you know, at the forefront of people's imagination. When I made the film, it was uh, the 10th uh, anniversary of that event. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, people will bring up Osama bin Laden, um, Hitler, all these different people. And, and again, I think the misunderstanding with universalism is the idea that... Um, uh, you know, God would say to these people, hey, don't worry about it, you know, we understand something went wrong and, you, you know, don't, you know, it's fine. That's not justice and that's not, that, that doesn't help anybody. And, mm -hmm. but the thing that I, I, my background actually, my educational background um, involves dealing with uh, young offenders. So I, I worked with young offenders and, and that was some of my education and looking at the sociology of deviance. How do people become deviant and how do we, how do we deal with deviance without, making them even more deviant. Mm. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I thought a lot about is the justice system. So if you think about our human justice system, there's a lot of goals that we try to achieve with it. Um, but most of us aren't aware of a lot of the goals. Um, so we're, we're pretty much aware that one of the goals of the justice system is deterrence. Right. So we'll impose a harsh sentence to try and scare people, other people from doing it. Mm. Another one is uh, the idea of, of restitution. Um, that you, you know, you do the crime, you do the time. So you got to make things right with society. Um, but, and, and then there's the idea of, of protecting the public. Um, you know, you need to take certain people off the streets because they're just too dangerous. Yeah. But I think the highest goals of our justice system are really um, rehabilitation right. and uh, restoration of the offender. So right. really what, what we would all like to see with anybody who commits something, some kind of a crime or, or does something wrong is that they would come to a full awareness of the of what they've done and the consequences, and that they would then seek in whatever way possible to make that right, so they could be restored as full members of the community. Mm -hmm. And so we are actually able to achieve that um, with certain individuals. And so my, I would look at God and say, well, if our instinct sees that as the highest goal of the justice system, couldn't God's justice? Um, uh, wouldn't it be, you know, similar and wouldn't it be able to succeed where we often fail? Mm -hmm. So I would think that the greatest good we could hope for, for a Hitler or an Osama bin Laden, or let's be fair, a George Bush, <laughs> um, would be that they would come to see um, the the depth of the consequences of, of the actions they took in the world. Right, right. And that, that they would feel true remorse and that they would have an opportunity because death has been defeated and God is without limits, that they would have an opportunity to rec be reconciled to those that they wronged. Yeah. I mean, what a great picture. Right, um, right. And, and, you know, I think once people who have been wronged can get over the anger, the hatred, and the sadness that they feel toward their offender, I mean, I would think that that would be the greatest good that, that anyone could imagine being achieved. And so... I, I, I will that would that be easy on the offender? No, I don't think so. But I think too often what we want to think about is justice yeah. that um, comes at the expense of the offender. Right. right. And, and we, we think certain people are or certain acts are beyond redemption. And mm -hmm. I refuse to believe that because it seems to me that Jesus went out of his way to go to the people in his community that everyone else thought was beyond redemption and to show that that was not the case. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it just takes a certain perspective of how you look at your sense of justice, right? So as you were talking about it, it's either like retributive or just punishment or it's restorative. And and, and I agree with you that I think the highest good would be, you know, the, the restorative understanding of, of justice. Because, I mean, you could lock somebody up, you know, to prevent crimes happening. But once they get out, <laughs> if they're the same person, then they'll just go out doing the same stupid crap that they were doing before, you know. So, I agree with that, you know, just the whole idea of like restoring a person and, 
you know, but we're throwing out these terms like um, like eternal conscious torment and uh, universalism and stuff. So now I obviously what I, what I see on TV, you know, just from my friends who are not as involved in in religion, their view of the afterlife, the the way they see Christians viewing the afterlife is just the typical eternal conscious torment. But what are the other views out there? If you could just kind of give us some definitions, you know, just so my the listening audience they have an idea what we're talking about. Sure. Yeah. So of course, eternal conscious torment is what it is. Is that um, you know, either by by the person's choice or by God's choice, uh, those who are considered sinners will end up um, somehow in a in a place where they will experience torment forever. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's this idea of annihilationism, which is that rather than um, exist in never-ending torment, sinners will at a certain point be um, destroyed; they will be annihilated. And then there's the idea of universalism, which is that. Um, and, and universalism, virtually all forms of universalism, include some form of post-mortem punishment, but ultimately that punishment is restorative and all people will be reconciled to God and to each other. And I think, that, by the way, the and to each other is really important because mm. you think even about um, uh, the relationship that forms between uh, a, a criminal and, and his or her victim. Mm. Um, just sequester, you know, if... if if you think about a courtroom setting, what is what is the victim when they give a victim impact statement? What do they want most from the offender? Which is an, an acknowledgement that what they did was wrong, and they want to see remorse mm-hmm. because otherwise the person who is victimized can never have peace. And so I really think that the restoration um, of offenders is as important to the victims as it is to the offenders. Mm-hmm. And all of us, by the way, fall into both categories. We're both offenders, and we're all, we're all offenders and victims at one right. level or another. And so we all have unfinished business with other people. And, and again, I, I come back to this idea that the best thing I can imagine is, is not just a, a bunch of us sequestered off in torment for eternity. Hmm. That just doesn't seem like a very good story. Right. And, it, and it, it, seems like a very, uh, it seems like a very weak vision mm-hmm. of God. Um, as well, so that's why I find I put myself squarely in the in the universalist camp. Right. Although I, you know, I really am not in the place these days where I want to go around trying to convince people that it's the the right way or the only way. But I just feel that it is the belief system that has yielded the best fruit in in my life. Hmm. Yeah, and I like on how you're talking about like the story of it all. You know, so in the film, you even talk about us living in some sort of narrative where we try to make sense of the world and. You know, several years ago, when I started questioning the whole like meta narrative that Christians offered, uh, you know, God creates a world, man fell into sin, now we need a savior, yada yada yada. Jesus dies on the cross to try to save everybody, but then only a few make it. <laughs> you know, yeah. and the mil- millions and millions of people are burning in hell, not for millions of years, but for all eternity. And then I started wondering, you know, where where is the victory in that? And it sounds like a pretty bad story, you know, and that that's just where. Another thing that came to my mind as I was studying and researching this topic of like, it seemed like God could have done a better job. You know what I'm saying? Well, well it's interesting though. When you think about nature, I mean, when you think about, um, you know, uh, the number of animals that are born in the wilderness, you know, and the number, this tiny number that survived. Like right now where I live, the uh, salmon are making their way up the rivers mm-hmm. to spawn and, and uh, many, many of them are going to be killed on the way there. Um, and you know, when, uh, an, an egg is fertilized in the womb, there's millions of sperm there, but only one of them fertilizes the egg. So it seems like there's an extravagance to the universe. You might just argue, Hey, you know, that's just the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Only, a, only a remnant <laughs> survives, you know? Right. Um, I don't know, but it, it does seem, again, it seems like a hopeless vision. And, and I think that the vision that the gospel, uh, the writers of the New Testament are trying to make over and over again is is to cast the net wider. The human mind is always trying to shrink the net, um, and and Jesus is always trying to to make it bigger. So you think about, um, you know, I love the story of of Jonah. Um, he wants to keep the net small, and God wants to make it big. And you know, the thing that that really confounds people in the Bible is not God's judgments; it's God's mercy. Hmm because he shows it to the enemy. And that's right. the thing about God that is one of the most difficult things for people to comprehend. Right. And I think that's where a lot of people take that passage out of context, the whole, you know, God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts above our... 
people usually do that when it comes to like uh, God repaying with evil, you know, and instead of just talking about God's mercy, right? Well, because the context of that passage is God's love. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. basically saying you can't understand it. It's, it's not his judgment that's incomprehensible at that point. You know, and, and, and you know, there's a, a New Testament echo of that in 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul says, you know, now we see through a glass darkly, yeah. but then we'll see face to face. But again, the thing that's hard to understand for everyone is love. Yeah, yeah. And it, that's, it's interesting because, you know, I've come across people who say, I wouldn't create an eternal hell for people, but I'm not God. You know, God can do whatever he wants, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, where they use that passage where his ways are higher than our ways. But they're not recognizing that that verse is actually talking about his love and, and his mercy. Right. You know, um, you know, so, for example, universalism, there are different forms of it. So, like, there, there's the type that if you're not a Christian, a lot of people are universalists where they say everyone's going to heaven, you know. And then there's a Christian universalist who say there is a hell, but eventually everyone's going to get saved in the end anyway. So why the need for a savior and people having to believe now if everyone's going to be saved in the end anyway? Well, because again, I think that this is, this is one of the problems is that we think about saved in the end. You know, Richard Beck is somebody who's had a real influence on me. He's a experimental psychologist right. from Abilene Christian University. I highly recommend his books as well, particularly The Slavery of Death, where he gets mm -hmm. into this idea that, that too many Christians have a death-centered faith, that really ultimately what it comes down to is, is what happens after you die. Yeah. And what he, the way he puts it is that Jesus smashed the stopwatch with mm -hmm. being death. That's what he did on the cross is he defeated it. And so, um, again, why do people need a savior? Um, all we have to do right now is look at the flood of refugees, um, you know, mm -hmm. trying to cross over from, uh, from Syria and other countries into Europe, into North America, and to look at groups like ISIS, to look at all sorts of horrible things going on in the world right now and realize we're in desperate need of being saved from the slavery of death because mm. we're all living in the fear under the you know the shadow of death and that's causing us to live in self-centered ways and mm. that tends to make us view other people as threats and so we we act out against them before they get us and we need to be set free from the fear of death this is what again this is what hebrews tells us the reason why jesus came because if we're slaves to the fear of death then we seek to enslave everyone around us and um, we're living in hell. And so we all need a savior right now from mm -hmm. the, the things that, that are enslaving us. And so that's where I come back to, again, the gospel is not about the future so much as it is about the present. I mean, it's about the present and the future, but I think that what Jesus is constantly doing is redirecting people's thoughts away from the present to the future, mm -hmm. saying, you know, to the Pharisees, you're stepping over the poor man on your way in to make yourself holy, mm -hmm. but it's stopping and helping the poor man. It, that's what makes you holy. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but we tend to revert back to a pharisaical way of thinking um, when we, we're constantly thinking about the next life. We're not looking at what's right in front of us and, and what the gospel has to say about how we can be set free and how we can help set others free. Yeah. And I think that's how like a lot of Christianity today is is just focus on, you know, what happens when you die. Like like even for myself, you know, back in the day when I was in high school, you know, I just thought about, you know, I, I had this tension, you know, should I be a good Christian or <laughs> should I do some stupid crap, you know? And so yeah. I would think like, oh, I'll ask for forgiveness later. And, you know, you think about like on your deathbed, like everything's okay when you're on your deathbed and then you ask Jesus into your heart, <clears throat> you know, something like that. And so I, I could kind of see on how, at least the Christianity that I was raised in, we always focus on just the afterlife, you know, without recognizing that there's a lot that we can experience in the here and now of just life, you know, and love and peace. So would you call, you know, just um, this whole idea of, of knowing Jesus or God as more of like an awakening kind of thing instead of just thinking about like a salvation from just going to hell kind of thing? Yeah, like I, I, I think that what happens is we we tend to totally underestimate or misunderstand the radical nature of what it is that Jesus was saying and demonstrating in his life. You know, somebody who's really been instrumental in helping me see this is a Rene Girard mm. and what he calls mimetic theory. And, you know, the person who really introduced me to that was Michael Harden. Right. And, uh, you know, what, what Rene argues is that, you know, the default mode for human civilization is that, 
um, we tend to build civilization on violence. Mm-hmm. And, and we tend to, because we're living in the fear of death, we tend to look at other people as the enemy. And so in, in order to overcome that, that fear, which, which could lead to a war, war of all against all, mm-hmm. we tend to scapegoat somebody and we say, oh, that's the person who's responsible for all this anxiety I'm feeling. And we eliminate the scapegoat and that gives us unity. And so you'll see that kind of idea that, that at the foundation of every civilization is blood. And it's, it's it, you know, he, if you look at the story of Cain and Abel, you see a demonstration of that is, is yeah. Cain kills Abel and then he goes off and founds a city. And, and what this really is, is, is almost a, a response to a lot of other founding murder stories that you'll see throughout all kinds of mythology. But what, what Jesus is doing is saying, you know what, um, you're ordering your whole uh, civilization um, you're building it on on the blood of innocent victims, and you're doing that so that you can find peace. And and the high priest Caiaphas, when they're deciding what to do with Jesus, he even articulates this. He says, "Better that one man um, should die than we should all perish." So, in other words, if we kill, if we allow Jesus to be killed, we'll find peace amongst each other. Mm. Uh, if we allow this revolution to continue, the Romans could destroy us all. Mm. So, so he was a scapegoat. He was a scapegoat, and he brought unity. And, you know, on the day he was killed, Herod and Pilate became friends. And, and so he performed the function of a scapegoat. And, but he did something different in that he came back from the dead. Right. And so what happened then is that he showed that the scapegoats that we tend to kill to bring peace, we always assume that they're, they're guilty. But what he showed is that actually, no, the guilty party is us. And that... Um, he, what, what he does then is present a new way to order society, which is a society that's around a victim. But instead of us gathering around the, the victim, pointing our fingers and declaring the victim's guilt, we gather around the victim, we bow our heads and our knees, and we declare our guilt, mm-hmm. and we ask for forgiveness. And the victim at the center of Jesus is Jesus. He's the one who's offered himself as the foundation now of this new civilization, which is the kingdom of God. So it's still a blood-soaked foundation, right. but it's a blood that's given freely by the one who has the power to overcome death. And so really I think what the gospel is 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 saying is it's questioning the very foundation of human civilization. Hmm. And, and the kingdom of God is a complete reordering of, of how we, we um, you know, relate to each other. Right. And, uh, you know, I don't think we quite get that yet. Right. Um, because the old way, the kingdom of darkness is still holding sway. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I think that what the gospel is, is a way of, it's a li- little bit of leaven, right, that works itself into the bread, and, and yeah. slowly more and more people are waking up to that. And, and so what does it really mean to be a Christian? I think it's, it's to live in that way. It's to mm-hmm. live in such a way that, that you um, make yourself um, the victim, if necessary, that brings unity, but it's it's the one that helps call out, um, call, make people aware, I guess, of of uh, the way the darkness that they've been living in, and it calls them out into the light. Yeah, and I mean, we it, it's gonna be uh, taking a while because it's like you, even on Facebook, like almost every single day, something pops up on my newsfeed of of just violence going on, you know, in schools and with police brutality and stuff like that, and. Well, uh, and, and and then how do we deal with people on Facebook? I mean, yeah. this this person who killed the lion, for instance, you know, you, you go, he becomes the scapegoat, right? And so we all gather around and point the finger at him, and we all feel good because at least we're not as bad as that guy, right? Right. And and it brings a sort of unity amongst those pointing the finger, but it's a very dark unity, yeah. And um, you know, it it and what it does is it distracts us from you know, our real problems. And, you know, the same thing happens, you know, right now with this, uh, you know, with the Syrian refugee crisis, Mm -hmm. it's very easy for us to point the finger at ISIS or point the finger at some of these other groups, uh, at Assad or somebody like that, um, because then we don't have to look at ourselves. Right. We don't have to look Mm -hmm. at the fact that, wait a second, why is this region of the world falling to pieces? Mm -hmm. Um, And what have we, you know, by funding different groups and, you know, getting involved in all these types of things, how might we have contributed to that? Mm -hmm. You know, so we're we're completely enmeshed in a scapegoating, violent world. And so I think the call to Christians is is to begin to live counterculturally in that, to refuse to become part of the mob. Mm -hmm. um, To side with the victim and to gently begin to awaken us and other people to 
you know, uh, the way that we're contributing to these problems that are in the world. Because it's so mm -hmm. easy to point the finger at somebody and then we don't have to deal with our own, our own stuff. Yeah, it makes us feel good. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, you know. we feel totally justified. Yeah. You know, because mm. at least we're not as bad as those people and, and um, you know, but I'm a big believer, like, again, going back to some of my education dealing with uh, deviance, you know, one of the things I studied was was family systems therapy. And I found it really enlightening um, because the way a family systems therapist approaches uh, a troubled individual is rather than treating them as an individual with a problem, they, they map out the family system that this person is enmeshed in. And what they see is the problems that this individual is experiencing are actually huh. symptoms of a, of, of a dysfunction in the system. Right, right. And so certain people are more susceptible to the dysfunction than others. And so they tend to act out in ways that aren't mm. appropriate. But if, and so if you can find a way to solve the problem in the system, you can solve the problem in the individual. Instead, though, what mm. we tend to do is just point the finger at the right. individual. Right. And and I think that you know the, that way of looking at a family is is a good way of looking at at the whole world, hmm. and and the way we operate. And again, showing that we tend to fall into you know scapegoating is our default mechanism. But what I really want to encourage people is to say, you know, when when something horrible happens, when somebody sins against you, resist the urge to point the finger, and instead treat the situation as a mirror to go what. Wh what do I see of myself in this situation? Mm. Why am I so angry? What is it triggering in me? Um, you know, what kind of changes can I make in my own life to help, you know, mitigate this type of situation? And I mm. think that, you know, if we thought that way more as individuals, if, if we thought that way more as nations, I think that we could actually make some kind of moral progress in the world. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's just so much easier to send a drone over and bomb us. <laughs> right, right. Man, that's good stuff, dude. Um, you know, I, I I love the part in the film where you show at least like at, at face at the face of them. You know, there are three three versions of hell that you can prove from the Bible, and then you lay them side by side, right? Like the the three different views that you gave, mm -hmm. and they all have their verses though, and their proof texts. You know, so in one column you have verses that support eternal conscious torment, and another column with verses supporting annihilationism, and then another column supporting universalism. And it's funny because people believe in an eternal hell, and yet they tell their critics, you know, you, you got to take the Bible seriously, when in reality, there isn't just one view of hell in the Bible, there are several. So my question is, you know, so why not just chuck it? Why not just say, screw it? Maybe this is all made up because the Bible is not even consistent with itself, you know? So, so why get so caught up with trying to prove our uh, particular version of hell if you can pretty much prove any position you want, if you just look for the right verses in, in support of it. So, because, you know, we could still ask the question, how did the writers of the scripture even know with certainty what happens after we all die? Well, you know, when I interviewed Kevin DeYoung, who appears briefly in the film, he's a, he's a hardcore believer in eternal hell. He's also a Calvinist. He, mm -hmm. he warned me, he said, you know, when you pull at the thread of hell, all kinds of things come with it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that's true. Um, and so some of the questions you ask are, are really important um, in terms of, yeah, how, how do we know that we're not just making this stuff up? How do we yeah. know that the biblical writers weren't just making this stuff up? Yeah. If you can pretty much proof your text, proof text your way into anything. So you have to remember, you know, in the battle, you know, the Civil War in the United States, you had people on one side proof texting their way to slavery and the other side proof texting their way away from slavery. Yeah. Um, we see the same thing happen with the Sabbath or with uh, the role of women um, in the church and in society. People will be able to point to all kinds of texts that justify their position. And yeah. I'm not sure if I really have a, have a, a viable way out for people on that because yeah. um, that's just the way it is. Now, number one, I would say that people have a misconception of what the Bible is. The Bible is not a book. You know, the Bible is a collection of, of ancient writings yeah. um, gathered from, a, you know, a multiplicity of sources and mm -hmm. coming from a vastly different periods of time and cultures and worldviews. So, to expect them to all conform is, is kind of a ridiculous idea. Right, right. Uh -huh. In the same way that, you know, you walk into any library you're not going to find every Everyone. author in the library agreeing. That's a ridiculous expectation. <laughs> so toss it out and recognize that what, what, what has been, re you know, even if we go back to the creation story in the Bible, we have like two different versions. We have two versions of right, almost right. all these primeval narratives in the Bible. Um, is that a mistake? No, yeah. I, think, I think that what's going on there is, is you know, these, these uh, even within the same books of the Bible, there's conversations going on. There's different voices in conversation. Yeah. 
we have a sense we have a, a sense in our world today of wanting to boil things down to bottom line everything to simplify everything that was not the way the people who wrote many of the books of the bible thought at all instead they embraced both sides of the coin you know if you look at even you know ancient jewish uh, mysticism the kabbalah you have the tree of life and it's all about balance and it's about you know just bringing seeming seemingly contradictory ideas together so yeah. th- we we impose so much of our cultural expectations on on the bible that that we're just not aware of yeah. and so we want to come to the, the definitive answer on this and it's just it's it's not going to happen yeah especially if we're always going to just you know, default by saying, "Well, what does the Bible say?" Especially when it says a lot of different, <laughs> a lot of different things. You yeah. Know? And, and well, that, that, that drives me around the bend where people say, <laughs> well, "That that view is not biblical." I'm exactly. Like, it was biblical. Well, a lot well, of stuff are biblical. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, I could build the case from the Bible. Um, so you know, but there's lots of things that you could say are biblical that are horrifying. Right. Right. You know, if you're going to use that term of biblical, what they mean is that doesn't match my interpretation of the Bible. Yeah. Although this is, again, one of the big mistakes people make is they fail to recognize that what they're doing is interpreting. They think right. they're just reading the Bible literally. Right. And uh, I go back and say, no, as uh, Thomas Talbot, who I interviewed for the film, but he's not in the film, he says, you know, uh, we don't read the Bible the way it is. We read the Bible the way we are. Right, right. And and, and that can't be, you know, that that is so true when I think about the way I read the Bible when I was 20 versus the way I read it now that I'm 44. Yeah. No, and that's where it becomes pretty challenging, you know, because like, you know, you have the people that you interviewed on in in the movie who had these uh, visions and traumatic yeah. experiences. And then there are people, you know, because it's like no joke. I, I really love studying about near-death experiences. And so the more that I, I read about them <clears throat> and watch documentaries, I'm like, this is this is kind of confusing a little bit because their, their their visions and their experiences were so real, but yet they are contradictory. You know, you could have... A guy who was an atheist have a near death experience, and then he ends up becoming a believer in Jesus and God. And then you have another eight, another person saying, in their near death near death experience, there is no God, you mm-hmm. know. And then another, you know, there's a book that I would recommend to a lot of people of this one lady who grew up as a Hindu, and and then she had this experience where there was no hell and she was God, you know. And so <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm hearing all these different types of stories. You know, I I could question. If it's if they're legitimate or not, but you know, as of now, I'm just like I'm giving the benefit of the doubt that they've experienced something now, whether it's objectively real, whatever that means. Um, but then I, I think about okay, there's all these different verses supporting different versions of hell in the Bible. What what makes them more special than us? You know, if, like if I can't take the word of people nowadays, uh, then why would I even need to resort to? Well, it really comes down to what the Bible says. You know. So, I mean, I'm just being honest of like some of my my questions that I have. No, and I think those are valid questions. I mean, I think that for me, for instance, uh, the Old Testament is very difficult because it's so murky in Mm -hmm. terms of the depths of time, you know, like how old it is. Whereas if you look at something, you know, some of the the New Testament writings, we'll say the book of Acts, for instance, or uh, the Gospel of Luke, which are really essentially one book or the letters of Paul. um, I think that... uh, you know, even though these documents themselves are 2,000 years old or roughly 2,000 years old, there's a sense to them, specifically Paul's letters, that, uh, you know, well, and I guess we could say the Gospels too, some of the Gospels. I mean, some, mm. some of the other Gospels are a little different in terms, like say the book of John in terms of, you know, the, the very clear theological agenda versus historical agenda mm. that you see in that book. Right. But some of these documents, we'll go back to Luke, really just seem like an attempt to record a history. Right. And so it really comes back to what you believe about the authority of the individual who wrote the account and then the how faithfully that account was transmitted to us over time. Yeah. And so, I mean, this is really, you know, a tough spot. Uh, if you read Bart Ehrman, for instance, uh, yeah. you know, he started out as an evangelical and became basically an atheist through his yeah. uh, study of textual criticism. Criticism, which yeah. is the study of uh, basically the textual transmission process from whatever the early manuscripts were, the original manuscripts were to the present. And so he found that that was so ambiguous that he really lost all faith in 
in uh, the accuracy. And then he started to be begin to believe that this idea of Christ being deified is a, is a later invention. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not going to shy away from the fact that uh, these questions could shatter your faith. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, it's... I, 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 re I read a lot of Aramid, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would rather, though, confront the universe as it is than I would want to hide behind um, any illusions I have about the universe. You know, yeah. Einstein himself, he wouldn't accept the consequences of his own theories because hmm. um, he just it just didn't square with how his view of God, and yet he was proved wrong. Hmm. So the universe is what it is, no matter what we believe about it. And, and the question is, are we uh, in a position where we're willing to accommodate ourselves to that? Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's just everyone, the question everyone needs to answer for themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it's definitely changed a lot because back in the day, I was so confident. Like, I knew where people are going to go if you, if you don't believe the way I do, you yeah. know, at least theologically, you know. But uh, but these days, to be honest, I'm, I feel like I'm <clears throat> more agnostic about what happens, you know, after we die. But I, I'm, I'm very open, you know, so I'm not the type who says, you know, this is the only life you get, then that's it. Once you die, boom, that's it. You know, there's no life after death. You know, I'm actually pretty open, but it could get pretty confusing, you know, hearing a lot of different the different stories of um, near-death experiences, you know. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, to me, I guess I don't, for me, I don't put a lot of weight on those types of things. I know a lot of, I know other people do, but I, you know, for me, I, I guess it comes down to this. Like, if you think about John Wesley, um, you know, people extracted from his teaching something called the Wesleyan quadrilateral, and I find it quite helpful, hmm. whereas where you look at, um, if you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, whether you have knowledge or whether you have, you know, a valid belief, you know, looking at this idea of, well, let's analyze it according to scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. So let's, yeah. these are all the ways that we form knowledge. These are all our belief producing mechanisms. Can we apply yeah. all four of these to this experience? And, and what do, do we come up with? But even then though, I think ultimately I would say the most important question to ask is what fruit it, it, the question I don't think the most important question is is not is this true what but would it produce what, kind what of sort of fruit life? does this produce in my life because yeah. I think that is the a, a great way a great path to discovering fruit that we tend to overlook because we want the truth to be an intellectual proposition versus a lived experience yeah. and and again what was what did Jesus do every time he met somebody trumped mm their intellectual propositions with their experience of him. Yeah. That, that happened over and over and over again. The archetypal person being Paul, who's all learned and he had all the answers, has mm -hmm. one brief experience with Christ, and it turns everything upside down. Mm -hmm. So this seems to be the norm in the Bible. Um, and yeah. so that to try and expect anything else to try and, you know, change that, I think it's kind of foolish yeah. that we have to allow experience to to open us up to a new way of looking at the world. Yeah, because in a sense, though, it's it's. I feel like it's subjective, though, because like you feel, like you, I think of Bill Bill Weiss, Bill Weiss, however you say, it, you know, like you think of it changed his life, you mm -hmm. know. But then at the same time, those who hear his story, it scares the hell into them. <laughs> you know, so we're like, <laughs> what kind of fruit does that produce? You know, yeah. what I'm saying so it's almost like a subjective thing. And you know, one of the criticisms that I would get, you know, like back in the day when I was very much into like the charismatic scene, where um. Uh, you know, because a lot of at that people at that time that I was running with in the circles would be getting visions all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and so they would say, hey, you know, you got to test your experiences in light of scripture, you know, because the Bible is the ultimate word of God and stuff. But then I would think about it, if, if our experiences aren't valid now, you know, the people in the Bible, they had their experiences and that became scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have anything to test it in that sense if we keep pushing it back. In well, time, and again, you know? and, and I think that that's... To say it's scripture, I don't believe that um, the Paul or the writer of Acts or Luke thought they were writing scripture. Right, I know that, yeah. You know, and so it became scripture, but it became a model. Right. Um, so what we see really is an account of people, the first generation of people trying to sort this stuff out. Right. Now, Peter gets that vision of the clean and unclean animals, hmm. um, which would be maybe a good parallel because he's asleep. Um, you know, it's a dream, really. And it'd be a good parallel to some of these near-death experiences. And it became authoritative. It also became very controversial. Hmm. Um, but it's the reason why you and I um, even ever heard the gospel, 
mm-hmm. um, because it told him that um, you know the gospel was for everybody, right. Jews and Gentiles. It became an authoritative vision, um, you know. But how was that determined? And, and you know, initially the re- religious authorities didn't accept it. But again, I have to come back and say you have to look at what was the fruit of that vision. Right. Um, and so even Bill Weiss, yeah, maybe it's had positive experience, positive fruit for some people and negative not. You know, sometimes, <laughs> uh, you know, um, but again, I think it's a stage of life thing. Yeah. Brian McLaren, I, I like what he says. He says there's, there's different ch- types of churches because there's different types of people. And sometimes maybe we need to hear a hell message because we're messing with things that could destroy us. And we need to be scared almost like an intervention to snap us out of it. But that doesn't mean that that hell message then becomes the defining message for our life. Maybe that's what we needed to hear at a certain time. But as we begin to mature, both in our beliefs and also just in the way we live, um, you know, the thing that we need to hear changes. And, you know, so, I, you know, I, I think that there's there's a lot of room for that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Jesus speaks harshly sometimes. He speaks softly at other times. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. You know, um, one of the things that would pop up in my head is about like if, if people really do believe in an eternal hell, you know, which I did for many years, you know, then like shouldn't they be going out like day and night, you know, trying to save people? Because I mean, obviously, you know, we could have fun in this life, but there are people dying like every single day, you know, ending up in a torture chamber. I know people don't like that phrase, but, you know, it's like a torture chamber forever, you know. So why, why don't we see a lot of people who supposedly believe in hell, you know, evangelizing like crazy then? Well, I, yeah, I think that because, number one, they don't really believe in it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, but number two, I think we're just self-interested and lazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, well, too bad for them. <laughs> At least we're honest. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm good. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's kind of a combination of laziness and just yeah. really, I think deep down, it can actually be that bad. I mean, it can actually be true. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, you know... I definitely think I would never say, "Oh, somebody who believes in hell isn't a Christian," because um, your internal eternal conscious hell or isn't a Christian. In the same way, I wouldn't want somebody to say someone who's a universalist right. isn't a Christian. But yeah. at the same time, I would have to believe that there are there are healthier and less healthy ways of looking at this issue. Hmm. And I would definitely put eternal conscious torment in the the less. Healthy. I, I would believe that by and large, the fruit of that belief is negative. It will mm. fall to the negative side of the scale. Yeah. Um, now, uh, some people might say that about universalism. If they misunderstand universalism, and they'll say, "Oh, that just gives you license yeah, to do whatever, you do whatever you want." Yeah. But, but to me, I, I, I think that then, well, that's not the universalism I believe in. That's that's something else. Because mm. what I believe, the universalism I believe in, is a God who is willing to redeem me despite my failings. And so, what does that turn me into? is the type of person who wants to be like that God. And so it takes my focus off me because whether or not I'm going to be saved is, you know, going to go to hell is no longer an issue. I'm going to be reconciled to God. I can do that the easy way or I can do that the hard way. Hmm. Um, And the same thing goes with my relationships with other people. Then I seek to become like the God I believe in. And that's a God who is not going to look at an individual as some sort of irredeemable repository of evil, but as somebody who is suffering and needs healing. Yeah. And when we go out into the world looking at everybody like that, I mean, think about it. Um, you know, I, I heard a story about um, ISIS, uh, some of the guys from ISIS, they were going to kill these guys. I think they were Egyptians and they were going to throw them off a roof. And before hmm. they did it, there was like a reconciliation between the two of them, between the victims and the guys who were going to have to do it. Uh, they mm-hmm. hugged each hug, hugged each other and and shed some tears, and then they threw the guys off the roof. <laughs> I was just about to joke around and say that, but that happened. <laughs> that happened. Oh man! But I mean, That's but crazy. the guys who were going to die, they they basically said, you know, they they didn't look at the people who were going to do it as as evil, but as people who were beholden to something, who were themselves victims, hmm. and they needed to be set free. And in their last moments, they used those moments to share that love with those people. Yeah. I think that's I can't think of a more powerful demonstration of what it means to be a Christian. Yeah. You know, that's why you know my listeners it's it's a mix of like believers and unbelievers, you know. So obviously for those who do believe in God, it's 
it does matter like your our perceptions of of god you know if you just view of god as like some sort of judge then you're just going to be looking you know guilty not guilty you know especially this judicial type of gospel that many of us have inherited you know but i like that on how you want to be like the god that you believe in who would be more empathetic and more merciful and gracious and and loving you know but but, but also hard in the sense that i mean i'm a dad of four kids right, right. i mean I am those things to my kids, but when my kids begin to do things that disrupt the community we have in our home or in, or outside the home, I stand hard sure. and, and I don't tolerate that and I work very hard with them to bring them back into line. So yes. it's not, yeah, so I, and I believe that's what God is. And, yeah. and so, but it's done for their, it's it's not done to destroy them. It's done yeah. as a way of, yeah. of calling out, you know, the goodness within them. So. Right. Yeah, no, I, I really believe, and that's the point I tried to make in Hellbound, you know, is that we will get the world that is a product of our, of our beliefs. Right. So um, that's why I, I, partly why I use 9-11 and partly why I use the Westboro Baptist is yeah. that this, this uncompromising belief that, that our way is the only way hmm. um, is a direct reflection of our view that God is the same way. So we will seek to recreate the world in the image of our God. Yeah. And what a terrifying thing that can be. Yeah, um, but what a good thing it could be if if we believe in a different God, and that's where I come back to this idea that um, I just feel that the although I, I think that at certain points in our lives, getting scared straight can be a good thing. Ultimately, mm. I feel that fear as a foundation is utterly destructive, mm. and I would want to call people away from that belief. Um, and uh, into a into a, a faith that is built on 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 relief on on um, an ability to just um, throw oneself into the arms of God without fear, yeah. because God should be the one that you finally arrive at and fall down because you've come to the end of yourself, and you can trust that things will be okay. Whereas I think that what happens with a fear of hell is that God is the one that you're forever. A little bit afraid of and that you in a sense are almost hoping you never have to meet <laughs> because yeah. you're going to be laid bare mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh you know like adam and eve in the garden and uh you're forever hiding and uh mm-hmm. i just I, I i can't see how that can be ultimately helpful for the world right right now i know even for myself growing up like fear did to be honest fear did keep me from doing <laughs> a lot of stupid stuff you know whether it's judgment from god or just the consequences Mm -hmm. Uh, from me doing some stupid stuff in my life um but i get that about how fear it wouldn't be healthy if fear was like you know at at the foundation of my life you know that's how i'm going to basically see everything you know and so i get the whole thing with tough love too of course if you know i'm not a parent yet but i I am an uncle (laughs) Uh, but i could understand to some degree you know since i'm not a dad yet um like you can't just let people slide you know it's like a, a loving parent would do something but at but it, it's at the, you know, seeing the heart of the person that you're trying to help and trying to restore them, you know. Um, now, don't worry, just last question, you know. Now, I know you toured the film and, and you did some Q&As here and there. Um, you know, how, how were the responses from the people in the audience when you did those? Did you do the Q&A in the movie theater? Yeah, yeah. So I when I released Hellbound, it would have been in the uh, fall of 2012. I toured yeah. it, uh, boy, I don't know, in a few dozen cities across uh, Canada and uh, the United States. I actually took it, I showed it in England and Australia as well. Um, yeah, I, I did Q&As in the movie theaters. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, it was kind of a fun experience because we were able to get into some, we got in the biggest chain of theaters in Canada. We worked, nice. out, a de- worked out a deal with them. They said if we succeeded in Vancouver, they would give us the rest of the country. And, uh, and we oh. did. And so... Uh, were these just random people that bought tickets or these are like churches that were invited for a special screening or something? No, it was, uh, well, I mean, of course we did a lot of promotion. We got a lot of reviews and, you know, did a lot of uh, direct marketing to all kinds of groups, colleges, churches, and that sort of thing. So, hmm. but yeah, we really had no control over who showed up. Okay. But yeah, so we did Q&As all over the place. And, and I would have to say that, yeah, the response was certainly, uh, you know, I got all kinds of responses to the film, but but I would say overall it was positive. Um, awesome. You know, that we that people found the film interesting, intriguing, because it asked a lot of questions that maybe they'd wondered about or never even thought to ask and, and just really got them thinking. I mean, there was some negative response to the film as well, but, you know, the sure. thing that really surprised me the most was, we actually had some good publicists, and they got us some a lot of coverage in the the mainstream hmm. 
media and to see, you know, like for instance, I'll never forget, uh, I think his name was Justin, Justin Chang, one of the lead reviewers for Variety, which is like a big, you know, Hollywood industry nice. uh, publication, gave us this long, really thoughtful, positive review. Nice. And, you know, it just kind of stunned me that uh, someone like him would, uh, you know, take the time and the interest to to really get into the film. And, and I felt that he really understood the film. And, then, you know, that kind of happened a lot of times. And so, you know, whereas Christianity Today kind of tap danced on the film yeah. um, in, a, in a really negative <laughs> way, which, which was really frustrating because, uh, yeah. you know, it just, yeah, I, I guess I just felt the attitude was just not what I would expect. Sure. You know, I never would have expected that we'd get a fair treatment from Bride. <laughs> Good Christianity today, but right, right. live and learn. No, it, it was such a good film, dude. Like I loved it, you know. And then I, I had a lot of people that I know uh, go buy it, and they loved it, and uh, really got them to think about, you know, this topic because it's so important, you know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I don't know any like hell movies, uh, <laughs> except for Hell Hellbound. I think there's a Chuck Norris movie called Hellbound or something. Yeah, I think I might have typed that in. Is is there a Chuck Norris movie called Hellbound? There, there is a Chuck Norris movie called Yeah. Hellbound. There's I also. I think the second Hellraiser movie is called Hellbound too. Oh, so. is it? So when I typed it in, I'm like, Chuck Norris, this ain't the, <laughs> the Christian movie. You yeah. know, but um, on a serious note, like I, I really did enjoy the film. I, I think you brought on some good good voices there to represent all the different positions. Now, obviously, I, I, I've heard some of your interviews where people were criticizing that they, they wish they had more airtime with their position. And I'm like, you can't do that. You know, it's just like you yeah. eventually got to lean on one, especially if you're the director. Well, um, it- and, and again, my purpose of the film was really uh, to say, because it just happened to be that universalism suddenly became a big issue. Yeah. But, but really the film was trying to say, well, why, of all the beliefs, things that you can believe about hell, why is universalism so controversial? Right. Because even within eternal torment, there's a whole bunch of different ways of thinking about that. And annihilationism was very controversial 25 years ago. Yeah. But why is universalism the, the whipping boy now? You know, why is that the point at which the word heretic gets pulled out? And that's right. so, yeah, the film is really asking the question is, can you believe in universalism and still be a Christian? And I believe the answer is yes. Yeah. And in fact, I believe it's the best way to think about it. Yeah. But you feel free to believe what you want. <laughs> right. And I love the way you, you know, you, you did the film because it wasn't, very dogmatic where you're like pushing it in their faces, you know, the, the voices who were speaking on different positions were, were just sharing their heart, you know, so I commend you for it. I think you did a really good job with it. Thank you. Yeah. So what, what's next for you? Um, I'm actually in post-production on a film called Fractured right now, which is, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I say it has nothing to do with hell, but it kind of does. Um, it's a, it's a film that, uh, looks at, uh, it's actually a film about the language that we use to talk about energy. So a few years huh. ago, I did a, I worked on a documentary called Spoiled, which uh, was trying to make the case that we're not addicted to oil, we're spoiled by oil. Huh. So that we live in a world that wouldn't be possible without the use of fossil fuels, but we're like spoiled kids. We take all the good things for granted and we get mad at, you know, the one thing we can't have. And yeah. so what we're doing in this film is kind of taking things a step further and in the film Fractured and we're really looking at um, the language we use to talk to talk about energy and how it's distorting our beliefs about energy and what really the connection to me that it has with hell is that what you see within certain pockets of the environmentalist movement is a very similar way of thinking that you'll find amongst people who believe in a no compromise view of eternal torment Mm. that if you start to question certain presuppositions about the environment and specifically the relationship of fossil fuels to the environment, you get branded the equivalent of a heretic. Mm. In this case, the term is denier. And that what we're trying to lay bare is that there's a rhetorical game that's being played that is purposely trying to wipe out the middle ground um, so that it can simplify the issue and make it black and white and that there's a lot of money to be made if you can keep things in black and white. And what I find about energy and the environment is very similar to what I find about hell is that it's very difficult to think in black and white terms once you really begin to study the issue huh. because it becomes much more nuanced and to make definitive statements one way or the other is, is very difficult. Wow. So yeah, so that's... When that's is that I, coming out? Uh, we'll be releasing later this fall. Um, oh, and okay. then, Yeah. That's so. soon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And I know you do film though, but are you ever going to plan on writing a book? Oh man, I planned on it, um, <laughs> planned. but uh, you know, I I You're just doing some uh, editing right now, or yeah, I've done uh, all kinds of things. Um, but yeah, the film is kind of the main oh, yeah, thing. That's your focus right time. now. Okay, but it's, it's not, uh, okay. yeah. So I would like to write some books and maybe. Oh, eventually. for sure, you should, man. <laughs> 
you know, how, how can my listeners keep in touch with you? Anything you want to plug besides the movie or what's your website? Um, yeah, you can go to hellboundthemovie.com. Um, okay. Again, the new movie coming out is, is called Fractured. And uh, I don't have a, we don't have a website for that yet. Check. We're just kind of in the launching uh, phase for that. But yeah, hellboundthemovie.com. I do, I, I do have a blog on Patheos. I have not been blogging there for quite some time. But, okay. uh, I'll, yeah, still, can, I'll still link it up because you got a couple of articles there too, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, I've got a ton on there. Oh, okay. And you're on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere? Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, man. I'll, I'll be linking all that stuff in the description. So, Kevin, it's been a pleasure. Great, thanks, to Roger. You, man. Yeah, great to, yeah. I think it's the first time we've ever talked. <laughs> I know. Like, I've heard you talk many times. So. I know, it's all good, man. Thanks for being on the show. Okay, thank you. All right, bye bye. Bye bye. Yo, that was dope. I really appreciate the things Kevin had to share. I know it's tough for a lot of people who were raised in the church to question the whole idea of hell. I know it was for me because I remember when I first started questioning hell several years ago and I know it sounds funny but I couldn't sleep for like two weeks man in the sense that I'd stay up every night just thinking about it and it's not that I wanted hell to exist but I was just so confused because the idea of hell was a part it was part of most of my life then to suddenly question the possibility of its existence you know it just started to change my perception of God and, and the way I looked at people so if you're interested, you know, do your homework on the topic. You know, is the idea of hell completely made up, you know, to scare people and to control people? Or is it true? And if it is real, then what does it reveal about the God you believe in? If you do believe in God, that is. And, you know, so be sure to check out the book Kevin Miller edited, which is the book that my friend Brad Jersak wrote called Her Gates Will Never Be Shut. It's an amazing and eye-opening book. And of course, check out Kevin's film Hellbound, which is a great documentary that's that's sure to stir up some discussion, some conversations, you know, watch it with your family or at church or in a home group, depending, of course, if they're open. But, you know, no matter what, watch it yourself and see if it offers a perspective you're willing to consider or maybe it'll even confirm what you already believe. Also, if you're into audiobooks, remember I teamed up with Audible.com and you can choose from more than 180,000 audio titles from there and download any of them absolutely free with a free 30-day trial. Just go to www.audibletrial.com slash flipside. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com slash flipside for any free audiobook of your choice. So go check it out. And if you enjoy this podcast, consider supporting me on something called Patreon. It's like a tip jar saying, hey, Josh, you know, we appreciate what you're doing and we'll love to keep the show going. And so any support, would really mean a lot to me guys because this does cost money out of my own pocket and it does take up a lot of my time as well so any donations would really help and I, I, I want to keep helping you guys along your journey so please consider being a patron don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and if you're really getting a lot out of this show uh, if you could just take a few minutes it's really easy to write a review and rate it on iTunes because it'll help more people discover it and of course, please share this podcast with your friends. So once again, thanks for listening. And I'll see you guys on the flip side. I'm out. Peace.